Hi, I'm Dana Yao, your host on the Emerging Markets Tech Startups Podcast. While traveling to over 90 countries, I was inspired by the entrepreneurial spirit across startup communities in Africa, Latin America, Asia, the Middle East, and Eastern Europe. On the show, we bring you stories from entrepreneurs, startup ecosystem innovators, and investors. We discuss what makes these markets culturally and historically unique, local trends, local challenges consumers and founders face, and the opportunities. Let's get started. So Simunza, welcome to the show. So happy to have you. I'd love to start off to understand, one, who are you? Let you speak to that. And mostly what user problems is Bongo High solving? It's a pleasure to be able to talk about what's happening on this side of the world, Southern Africa and Zambia, to be more specific. I lead uh, entrepreneurship support at Bongo Hive, which is an entrepreneur support organization based in Lusaka, Zambia, that supports uh, currently supporting uh, entrepreneurs across uh, various countries within Southern Africa. And what's your personal mission slash vision for seeing how Bongo Hive changes the economy? Oh, our mission at Bongo Hive really is we work with great minds building viable solutions that change the world. We're in the early phases of that. We still hold to that and continue to push towards uh, being able to get startups that come from this region that then can add value to the world. And we and they don't have to be tech startups. They could be they could be, for example, startups in the in agriculture. And but then them being able to supply food to the rest of the world is something that we we, we would be keen to see. We've worked with startups and the we uh, nine years to be to be we've worked with startups and a lot of uh, small businesses um, uh, in the range of about a thousand three hundred entrepreneurs that we've worked with. Um, in the last four years, we've helped uh, uh, companies get uh, resources uh, in the tune of at least a million dollars at pre-seed level. And uh, amongst the entrepreneurs we've worked with, we've largely worked with um, uh, 53% uh, of them happen to be uh, women entrepreneurs, which gives you um, an idea of the need that, we, uh, and that, we, with, that we're addressing in the market that we work with. Prior to Bongo Hive, there wasn't this type of resource to help small businesses and entrepreneurs? What we came in initially to do was to then support tech businesses and tech startups. But what we found was that the pool of tech uh, skilled people uh, intending to start startups wasn't as many as we initially thought there were. But then second thing was that, and why we became uh, sector agnostic, was that we then also realized that it would be great, there was an opportunity to learn about the various sectors. So if you talk about agriculture, education, you talk about logistics, you talk uh, the various sectors, and then uh, observe where there were opportunities to then leverage technology to, to, to become a supporting uh, infrastructure within those sectors. So we, over the last four years, we became uh, of being agnostic. We've now had a better sense of where technology can be leveraged. You are the Paul Graham of Zambia. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, let's talk about the founding story and how like your journey was part of that. So what motivated you? And I know there's three, four other co-founders. Yeah, there's three other co-founders. So I'll start off with... Uh, Lukonga, Slumesi, and myself all returned to Zambia around. We all start, either studied outside the country or lived outside the country for a while and returned to Zambia around the same way. And, the, and we kept bumping into, into each other in certain forums. Bart and Lukonga worked together for an NGO and they initially started off with uh, a project that they had that uh, supported um, schools of uh, schools of education, getting infrastructure like computers and so forth and so on, getting installed into those education so that teachers in uh, people who are learning to become teachers were already um, had some level of IT skills before they got deployed into the schools. 
Lukonga started, uh, got inquisitive and started asking these interns about, okay, great, once this internship is over, what are your plans for the future? I started inquiring into what skills they would like to learn uh, whilst, whilst doing that. Um, that conversation happened to come across uh, myself and uh, uh, Slomesi and myself, and we got involved as volunteers, and we thought it was a cool thing to help out on the weekends with regards to we, we, with helping them uh, learn about frameworks that existed, stacks that were available that they could access if they wanted to build things. Android then became a thing um, very, very early. So if we talk about 2011, and it was weighing out smartphones, then became the next technology that we were looking at with regards to if people didn't get computers on their desks, uh, then uh, they were more likely going to have mobile phones. And uh, the way off between iOS against Android, we knew that the price point of iOS immediately meant that Android was going to be the next, the popular platform in Africa. And the question then for us was, how do we then get people to start developing apps? Or how do we get people um, the young people to learn how to develop apps because this wasn't a thing in universities yet. And so we held Zambia's first Android uh, workshop that, was for, that lasted two weeks. We were fortunate to have met somebody from uh, Canada uh, who was willing to come over and teach uh, and during this workshop. And two apps that came out of that were an app that helped Zambians um, read the constitution and contribute their ideas towards the constitution that we were drafting, a new constitution that we were drafting. And two, Bantu Babel being an app that helps, uh, that helped people get language context, uh, phrases that you, you'd need to, if you were in Lusaka or Zambia, really, and needed to get around. Um, so phrases like, what are the directions to, or where do you catch a bus, or where can you get food, and things like that, if you needed to, to be able to, to get through that. Um, unfortunately, though, people couldn't yet make money off those apps because um, the Play Store didn't allow um, apps in Zambia to be monetized at the, at, at the time. So that was one of the pushes that then pushed us to work okay, great. If people needed to figure out how to create business models and then create businesses out of these techs or these apps or these websites that they were going to build, uh, how could we help them understand how to, to model their businesses? And over the, over the years, we then started designing programs for that. And that's what led to us then launching our programs, Discover, Launch and Thrive in 2016. It's the second time I'm hearing this story. I'm still inspired by it. So thank you guys for doing this work. Nine years in the making. You guys saw the trends in Android upcoming. It's like, but that's so crazy to think about 2011 and how long ago that was. I want to talk a bit more about the market specifically. So how large is Zambia in terms of population? Uh, Zambia is at, uh, is, is at 18 million at the moment. 18 million. Okay. So like a small Chinese city. But <laughs> and what are things you think make either Zambians or the market in uh, Southern Africa unique? The first thing is the people. And um, if, you give, if, you give, if you look at really, Z uh, Southern Africa and Zambia historically, it's uh, gained our independence roughly around 1960, very close relations to the countries around them based on a number of historical factors like Zambia was a point, it was a leverage point for uh, the freedom struggle of a number of countries around, that, uh, around us. So for example, uh, South Africa's liberation struggle is that the ANC, which is still the ruling party in South Africa, was headquartered in South Africa, was headquartered in Zambia until 1990, until 1990, if I'm correct, um, before uh, when uh, Nelson Mandela got out of prison, then then uh, return, uh, and then the ANC returned to South Africa. So that has that has led to that has led to very close relationships between Zambia and the countries in the region. So if you talk about Zimbabwe, Namibia. Uh, uh, South Africa itself, uh, Mozambique, is Zambia was involved in the setup of uh, of a number of this. So this 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 leads to the Southern Africa development community as a close knit community because of that. Second thing is that um, the even though the the people we are as as clans, tribes, or 
uh, we, we may be slightly different uh, within that regard. We have things that are culturally, we have elements that then uh, across borders still hold us uh, close to one another. So the market opportunity then becomes, uh, the market opportunity then within the Southern African region, if you combine the countries, uh, then becomes uh, great if you look at it in that context. So if you look at 18 million uh, people, that could be a city in, in other countries. But when you look at the region, you then realize that uh, solutions that then come out of one country can then penetrate other regions um, uh, if scaled out properly to be able to do so. And the fact that we almost all speak, except for Mozambique and Angola, that we all speak English as one of the languages that we use, then that also facilitates uh, market entry uh, uh, in, in that regard. Then more, very few people know this because uh, we, we, people then concentrate on, um, uh, on, on, on things like the politics and so forth and so on that happen with certain countries. But very few people realize that, for example, countries like, for countries like uh, Zimbabwe have got very, very high literacy rates. I think probably they're still the, the highest literacy rate in, on this continent. So you've got that kind of resource to be able to take advantage of with regards to building solutions and market, uh, market penetration and building uh, and, and getting good businesses uh, off the ground. A lot of the things you're saying resonate and just elevates what I do th think startup founders should be focusing on. You talked about regional approach. So many times when I visit ecosystems such as Tunisia or where, where did I go? Belarus, the markets are small, but unless you think regionally, it's it almost becomes your own trap. So I love that you realize Zambia's potential goes beyond the 18 million people, but across to the, how, how big is uh, Southern Africa, the region in terms of population? I actually haven't looked at the number. <laughs> <laughs> is is it more or less than 100 million, let's say? Oh, no, no it's more. Than, it's, it's definitely more than 100 million. And you see examples like that, uh, such as Singapore, right? They've done really well operating from Singapore and Malaysia, which are smaller countries, but then regionalizing their products to support those markets. I'm curious, if we wanted to build a market for either Zambia or or to South Africa tomorrow. What do we need to know about people's mindsets, the culture, any history? For ex I'll give you an example. In Sofia, um, they were like, "Oh, if you build a tech product and you charge people, you'll never have traction because people here one they don't really believe in tech, and two, if it's not free, we're not using it." <laughs> <laughs> so, what are things that yeah we have to understand about the people's mindset? in South Africa, uh, in Southern Africa. There's, a, there's the gap between um, what you would generally call a middle class is very thin in, uh, in the context of the populations that we are dealing with in Southern Africa. And so uh, if you are going to build solutions for that, um, then you're going after a market that potentially does have the resource, does have the money, but then isn't as wide as you would have hoped it would be if you, for example, dropped yourself in a European country or if you dropped yourself in America. So even if you went into Asia, like India, for example, then you then find yourself, if you're going to go for consumer products, the, the scale is then within the mass market, which then is a low income market. And so then your design for a low income market is going to be very different from if you are going to be approaching a middle income market. So um, it would be great to have a startup like Nest in, 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 in these markets, but how big is the market that can consume a product like Nest outside of South Africa and maybe, uh, yeah, outside of South Africa really. I mean, the rest of us buy it because yes, we can afford to get it, but then uh, if the market isn't going to be that, that wide. But then if you design products for, uh, and, and when, I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I say design products for the low income mass market, I'm not saying, design products with the lens of pity. Understand that the low-income mass market has aspirations too, 
So can you design products that meets their aspirations and helps them to grow out? Because then you're growing, you're beginning to build that middle income market that then is the future growth for businesses and more businesses that uh, a future, not only your business, if you've got a 150 to 100 year plan, but also future businesses that grow the economies of this country. So you've got to look at what the market growth is going to be for a continent like Africa. And then knowing by placing yourself in the correct position, then you begin to do that. So the nuances then you then get to go for is uh, access to access to infrastructure, access to internet, uh, what type of devices are, are they going to be using and what are the things that matter to them the most uh, and that. So are you dealing with education? Are you dealing with access to access to, to, to the basics like food? I mean, like we, 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 we joke, and we, we, we tend to joke about why we don't have startups addressing certain things compared to more, the more developed countries is, um, is we, we say, well, we're still addressing the issues at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy. Um, so whilst you've got, the, you've got the comfort of now dealing with self-actualization is we still need to build startups that can help people get, get move from the next, from one tier to the next tier. And then the market continues to expand whilst we do so. Yeah. And that's another thing I'm really inspired by. In emerging markets, I see the startups more socially inclined to solve these problems, like you mentioned, at the bottom of the pyramid, which affects more of the population across the world. Have there been any startups, either in Zambia or across uh, Southern Africa, that you've seen that either have interesting business models or products that have been successful? A few years ago, um, payment gateways were an issue. So when I talk about uh, when we started helping startups, one, one thing that was difficult was getting them being able to access money. And I think um, money transfer across the region, and first of all, within countries and across the region using mobile phones was the first blowout that turned. So Zona grew out of that and then now we're seeing the likes of um, other companies now taking that model and now enabling people to now not only work within, within, uh, within the context of the country, but then start to take that into the next country uh, and so that those transfers can happen um, w within that. We're looking at um, companies like um, uh, Zazu, that's beginning to then address uh, what um, the market needs are with regards to uh, people being able to open up bank accounts um, from the mobile phones, uh, being able to transact, being able to transit, uh, being able to, to then uh, send money to other people, but also make payments um, uh, across that. So we've just helped a company called, uh, we've just been working with a company called Digital Pago in Zambia that then also then lays the infrastructure for other fintech startups to be able to then build on top of that infrastructure. I know when I was in Zambia, I personally came across Zipos. And what was the other uh, trucking startup? But maybe you can talk about their business model or what they do, because those stories are really inspiring. So Zipos, for example, is a good example of um, startups that meet the needs of uh, the emerging or the viable uh, mass market. and. But what they do is they work with, um, they've designed a product for micro retailers and micro retailers being shops that are in, shops that are in low income communities and uh, that are possibly manned by one store, probably a cubicle. But then to, one of the challenges that they face is um, access, to, access to capital. And that's another, that's another opportunity that, uh, that uh, we find startups who are working with is helping people get access to capital, uh, to finances. And we, but then one of the challenges that those small businesses have is record keeping. They don't have formal record system, record keeping, um, re formal records that help them then get money from a bank, which again, uh, with high interest rates in the region of 30 plus percent at the banks, um, doesn't allow a lot of uh, micro retailers to then also access money from the bank. But what Zipos is doing is helping by helping them digitize their transactions within the shop um, so that one, they can do stock taking and two, they can mark up when they need to order, they know when they need to order products 
but also um, have a record of transactions that have happened. Uh, this allows uh, financial institutions to get a digital record that they can see of, of, of how often transactions happen within a business and then give them a level of, and then give them uh, a, a level of, in, a level of uh, money that they can then borrow from the institution whenever they need to borrow for, to restock or if um, uh, a, a shock happens to happen in the lives of the owners of the business. Then you've got um, uh, Musanga who do uh, logistics um, in the sense of being able to help, uh, being able to help businesses move goods from one place to another, but using an app in the same way that uh, you would use Uber, for example. So a factory that needs to get a factory that needs to get produce uh, towards stores can uh, list the different list the different places they need their produce to be taken to, um, and then have uh, a truck driver who might not be busy at that time, come over, pick them up, and then make sure that that delivery happens. So in a similar way, the, truck, the, the, the factory doesn't have to worry about owning tr delivery trucks, but it then can hire trucks that are available on a platform to then make that, uh, to, to get that to d the delivery to happen. With ZPOS, I didn't know they were doing the additional things of getting the data to then potentially give them access to loans as well to connect them to banks. So that's in another addition where it seems like they're creating, not just solving one pain point, but creating an ecosystem for these micro retailers that is really just inspiring. And I would love to see them scale across beyond just Zambia, but across the region because micro retailers and their challenges and the fact that not many companies are solving them is a challenge across the world. So it's examples like this that your organization is helping to scale and help them, helping them succeed to solve problems for the global North and South. For the last part, want to talk generally about the startup ecosystem in Zambia or across South, Southern Africa. It, out of the three, and you have to choose one, what do you think is the biggest challenge? One, lack of quality startups. Two, talent in terms of hiring talent or investor investment. Well, and I have to choose one. Um, I've, I'll, I'll go with investment. At the stage that at the stage uh, nine years now, uh, and where we are, and and that include and that includes four years of actually working with startups. Um, we've investment um, is now the next piece that we need to solve for. And whilst there is investment in the market, um, largely around, um, and, 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 and there's a lot of work being done, and so I will, I, we, will, we will not credit, take credit for being the only ones trying to solve this, is, is, is there's a lot of work being done around trying to bring uh, capital closer to businesses. But what we've seen is largely a lot of attention, uh, a lot of investors uh, coming into the market looking for businesses that are in the range of uh, investment opportunities that are in the range of $2 million and above. And we understand that. Um, given the work that needs to be due to, to qualify an investment, but also given the, given the proximity of uh, the Southern African region towards um, where the investors are coming from, if they're coming in from Europe or America, um, uh, we, we understand that it makes sense for them to then make, to make uh, larger deals. However, for their pipeline, you still need to accelerate the growth of businesses that can get to that level of consuming $2 million, $5 million or, uh, uh, and above. And what we are now doing is working on an investment vehicle that will that will that will address the um, that will that that will that would address the the missing middles gap uh, specifically towards um, Southern Africa and uh, pre-seed and seed uh, investment level. Uh, whilst we continue to support them, uh, the acceleration of their growth to the level where then the next level of investors can then uh, uh, take them on. It is great that you're solving this problem because when I first heard about this problem, I was like, it's so ironic. These investors are saying they have too much money 
<laughs> they can put into start put into earlier stage startups. And for me, I was befuddled, but I understand. I was speaking to an investor from Lightspeed and talking about, well, why are we saturating this market, Silicon Valley, with more money when that money could have more bang for its buck? With two million that you're investing in a startup here, you can invest in like five startups in Southeast Asia or Africa. So why not do that? But that that's not necessarily how they think. And I'm glad you are creating something to solve for that because all of those funds that should be going to earlier stage startups that are not going to to nurture them to eventually be able to take in, let's say, $2 million at one time. Are, have there been any major milestones in the last nine years, either of Bongo Hive, that you've seen that has propelled and enabled a, mo- a momentum in the ecosystem? So roughly four years ago, the first time we had uh, in Zambia, the first time we had uh, um money invested into a tech startup was a milestone for us because then the case was made that technology was definitely locally built technology could definitely address um local solutions and 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 um, and there was uh there was people who would believe that it could grow that it could scale and could grow and could then could they could potentially it was something that could be viable so that was that was that 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 was that was that was, that was a great milestone in the local ecosystem, and and seeing those investments grow um, year on year, um, and not just amongst tech startups, and starting to see more investments start to come through has been has been encouraging. Um, it, it was just this week that Lupia, who are doing, uh, who have built a platform to for for people to to access credit um, online. Um, recently raised a round of a million dollars. Working on our regional program, so we formed a partnership with other with other hubs in the region. So uh, M Hub in Malawi and Tech Village in Zimbabwe that we called um, uh, that we call the Southern Africa Venture Partnership. Sorry, I forgot to include our startup in Namibia as well. Together, we formed what we call the Southern Africa Venture Partnership as a platform that not only is um, a peer exchange platform with regards to how we are helping startups, but also a market opportunity to help startups then get into other countries. So then that was, again was another milestone where we now said, okay, great, beyond our own countries, how do we then start to establish and start to build this regional opportunity for businesses to then grow and, and find pads that they can um, launch pads that they can get into when if, if if they step into another country. You also told me before what helped a lot of the momentum early on was these partnerships from these or- other organizations. Can you talk a bit about that? Uh, getting the local ecosystems to understand what we were trying to do. So it was, hi, we want to work. We are working with startups that are building technology, and they hadn't yet figured out what uh, or what we were doing and how they could fit in with what we were trying to do. And but fortunately. I think what was happening was that as uh, innovation and disruption was happening in markets around, people then started having people started then questioning what's going on with what what are what are these things called startups, and what's happening in the other world and what's happening in Africa with regards to that. And fortunately, we found that we started getting CEOs uh, visit us and then starting to have conversations around what's going on, what's going on in the market. And how can we get involved in getting a lens on what's going on and what resources from our companies start to start to get around? So we've been fortunate that, for example, Liquid Telecom and MTN uh, are companies that have partnered with us with regards to providing internet for for companies that uh, startups that we work with. They provide internet in our space. We've had um, we've built relationships with. Uh, uh, law firms, for example, like uh, Musa Judy and Company, who provide pro bono um, legal advice in the uh, for startups in the program we, we work with. This year, we've rolled out. Uh, this year, we've rolled out rolled out a mentor-driven capital program that then has given us access to over forty business uh, uh, leaders and corporate professionals who want to get involved with mentoring startups. And uh, we've taken through a program that uh, that gives them the first touch practice of how to mentor and how to work with startups over a three month period and holding them towards milestones and giving them uh, support um, uh, in, 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 in that regard. 
So, so, so that that is an addition that is additional support with the, within the growth of the the, the ecosystem. A, con a new conversation we're, we're starting to have is around corporate innovation. Is we've been approached by a number of corporates, um, uh, first of all from the finance sector, that have come to us and said, "Okay, great, working with startups is one thing, but how do we then uh, in embed uh, innovation as a culture within our own corporates?" so that we can then start to harness new ideas that start to bubble up amongst our own teams, but also get a lens towards how we read our data and start to see where the opportunities might be so that as we start to build new products and new services, we can start to explore those, but also build the agility within our own corporates to be able to do that. So that's another, that's another benchmark of uh, an opportunity that, uh, that we're starting to, to, build, uh, to build ourselves towards. The other milestone you forgot to mention was when Prince Harry came to visit. <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's a 30 second story. We got a surprise call from uh, the uh, DFID, which is the Department for uh, Foreign um, and International Development from the United Kingdom, who we have a great relationship with. So they, they, they called us out of the blue and then said, hi, we'd like to come and visit, visit you. And we said, but you always visit us, so you're welcome to do so. I said, no, 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 we, 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 we're thinking of bringing a, uh, a high-level visitor to, to, to visit you. And we said, okay, cool, that's, that's also okay, which you've done before when you've had your, your people from your offices in the United Kingdom come to visit us. But over the course of, over the course of um, months, we kept going back and forth, and they kept preparing, sort of like mentally preparing us for, like, no, this is a visitor that you're not prepared for, so we would sort of like need to prepare you for that. And we had meetings with them. That it's like, are you that sending engaged. God? No, would, <laughs> How are we not prepared? <laughs> yeah, it was, no, you, we, you actually need to be prepared for your need security. And all this while, they, 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 they wouldn't name drop. They wouldn't let us know who it was. But we sort of slowly started trying to get hints because when, when, when during the course of those, it was we were, we were preparing for security. And in the security meeting, we had people from um, Scotland Yard. Then we're like, why would somebody from Scotland Yard be in a meeting with us? And then it was people from, um, uh, from Buckingham Palace, I believe, who attended the next meeting. They're like, oh, this might be royalty. But we still didn't know who it would be, who it was. Until one day we were, we were on, I mean, money on business. Then, uh, then I think it was Buckingham Palace that then announced, say, oh, there'll be a royal visit and uh, Prince Harry will be visiting Zambia. And amongst the places that he'll be visiting is a tech hub called Bongo Hive. So we found out with the rest of the world and like the confirmation of who it was. Then he met with uh, an enterprise that was the Empower that are working around solar. And Empower were the one startup that were going to give him a pitch. And the pitch goes perfect, perfect pitch. Uh, Prince Harry loves the pitch and then asks, do you have your business card? And Jacob forgot to carry his business card. <laughs> <laughs> That's not surprising in the startup ecosystem because people are like, who holds business cards anymore? Yeah, we all use LinkedIn now. But then, yeah, right. on that day, he, 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 the one person who asked for his business card, he forgot to give them to him. That's so hilarious. I hope his response was, oh, Prince Harry, just add me on LinkedIn. Who needs these films, flimsy <laughs> papers that you're going to toss away anyways? <laughs> well, the beauty of it is when we finished the tour, Prince Harry then followed up to say, can I please have that piece of paper with your, with your details? That's so sweet. I hope he followed up. He got his number. <laughs> Last question. How can the world help? You guys are doing amazing things. And the whole idea of creating this podcast was to serve as a platform to showcase the amazing things you guys are doing, but also to the world, figure out ways how they can help you guys. So maybe what are the one to three things? Working around product design and so on and so on. If people have time to lend themselves towards that and strategy development, we are always happy to connect mentor, them to mentors, our startups to mentors that can, uh, that can work with them uh, in, in need. Um, support um second one is what i talked about with regards to investment um so realizing what the the challenges are around that we are building the vehicle to then manage resources for uh 
LPs that are interested in the southern in Southern Africa and the and the types of startups that we support and the types of challenges that we would like to address on the continent uh, going out into the world, and so we're keen to to meet with uh, uh, with people around there. And a third point um, that I would uh, also look at is that. Um, Building out technology as a service is we're also keen to work with people who are willing to work, uh, lend some support and some time around CTO as a service. A lot of the startups have got first time CTOs in their, in their companies. So if somebody's, if, if there are people willing to um, offer mentorship or uh, some time towards working with their CTOs um, around uh, in an advisory role, we are also very, very keen towards uh, to connecting uh, the startup founders to, to, to people like that. CTO as a service, that is such, that's the first time I've heard that term and it encapsulates it so well. And I really appreciate you being explicit about these things because now that you say it, I'm like, yeah, all these dots I should connect. I Simunza, thank you so much for your time. I've learned a ton. This is the second time we're talking and I continue to just learn so much more. And thank you for your dedication. I can't believe it's been nine years. I mean, some of these tech companies that have been here have only been around for less than that time. So your dedication to the ecosystem is amazingly inspiring. And I can't wait to talk to you next. And oh, I, I always enjoy having conversations with you. And, it, uh, and thank you for uh, shining the shining spotlight on emerging markets. Thanks for joining us today on the Emerging Markets Tech Startup Show. If you have questions, comments, requests for me to cover an emerging market, or want to be connected with today's guests, leave me a comment in the reviews or find me on Twitter at Diana Yao. Until next time, 